All right. Hello, everyone. This is a very exciting conversation for me. I hope you're going to enjoy it as much as I will as well. Uh, this is Marty Fish. Marty Fish at one time was one of the best tennis players in the world. Top 10, top eight, dare I say. At one time, around 10 or so years ago, he was the best American-born tennis player on the planet. He was uh, killing it, and he had a great career. 2004 silver medalist, Olympic Games. I know he doesn't like to talk about that very much, but it's a great accomplishment. Uh, but as of late, he has been in the news because he was the subject of a tremendous documentary. I cannot uh, recommend it enough. It's called Untold Breaking Point about his trials and tribulations, his career, his ups and downs, and of course, his battles with mental health. I uh, want to talk to him about that and a whole lot more. He's a huge MMA and fight fan too. So that's very exciting for me. Marty, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me. Like you said, yeah, I'm a big, uh, big mixed martial arts guy. So um, I've been a big fan for a while. Uh, in fact, in your Twitter bio, it says amateur mixed martial artist. Yeah. Have you actually yeah. fought before? I mean, it's it's kind of half a joke, half I'm training for uh, to get towards an amateur fight. Really? Like, you know, like handpicked, you know, on our, on our own on our own uh, uh, merit. But but yeah, I, I want to eventually and I'm 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 probably I'm 39, almost 40 the end of this year. Um, so I'm thinking like, I don't know, something earlier than 42 years old, maybe like because I just sort of started training and practicing um mixed martial arts and like i've always uh like just like eight months or so now and um and so i've always wanted to learn the the craft and i've i've i i love um the strategies and as we get into the <laughs> mixed martial arts talk right away uh yeah. um i love uh i love the 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 conflicting styles and and you know a uh, a jiu-jitsu uh, uh, against uh, a Muay Thai or, or a boxer against a wrestler. I just, I love the, the craft um, and I've wanted to learn it for a long time. Um, and I, I, I was out here in LA and I was just sort of looking through and I cold called a couple spots out here and boxing one. And, you know, and I wanted to do some fitness as well and learn, you know, and learn how to defend myself maybe. And um and uh, uh, one guy, and I just got really lucky, you know, things just sort of fall into place. And I got really lucky with a guy um, who used to fight, um, not in the UFC or anything, but he was a, he was a, a, a good professional fighter. Um, and, uh, and he's my coach. And so like, I, I hire him. Um, he comes probably three, four times a week on the other days I practice on my own. Um, and uh, we're just getting into the jujitsu and grappling stuff now, um, which, uh, which uh, he he's a he was a Muay Thai fighter, so Muay Thai kickboxing sort of stuff. So that's how we started. Um, so I I sort of follow along like the Donald Cerrone's and the you know like sort of try to try and study those types of fighters. So yeah, I do I do in a long winded answer. I do want to fight. I do want to like figure out what it feels like or learn what it feels like to get hit um, for real. Um, and I'm excited to do it. I just I got a lot to learn. Right. Wow. Okay. So you might be the first uh, amateur MMA fighter slash celebrity golfer, right? Because you're killing it on that on that front as well. well. Golf, uh, golf, and tennis. You know the country club. Bo Jackson is right. maybe the uh, the um, maybe my my title. I don't know. Like I I grew up playing tennis and golf. Um, that was and baseball, but mostly tennis and golf. Both of them. Um, have become have come really natural to me um, my whole life. I, I don't play a lot of golf at all, but um, but uh, when I do, I drink Dos Equis. No, when I do, I uh, I play these uh, these these celebrity golf terms and stuff. They're super super fun. Made some awesome relationships and friendships over the years. Actually, uh, one um, a couple of years ago with Canelo Alvarez because I'm a wow. big boxing fan as well. And Canelo and I are really good friends now. He's a sweetheart of a guy um, outside the ring. Um, or or non promoting uh, his fights now um, and uh, and so he 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 and I play a lot of golf together and stuff so I learned from all those guys. Wow, must be nice to just drop like hey, Canelo and I, sweetheart of a guy, we play golf together. I didn't know you roll <laughs> that deep in the fight world, so much respect. Uh, and I'll ask you a little bit more about fighting in a bit because I am curious. You know, like you kind of popped up on my Twitter feed, and I was like, Marty Fish liking you know my MMA tweets. I wasn't really expecting this because you know tennis 
country club. It's well, a bit I slid of a into the DMs. I mean, I slid into your DMs. You did, I'm yes. A fan and, yes, yeah, you I'm did. A fan you did. I like to watch. I've been watching for a long time, the UFC for a long time. The guys that, um, um, I, I'm, I guess I'm name dropping a lot. The guys that uh, that own it, um, the, the guys at WME, Patrick Weitzel and, and Patrick, Patrick and I are really good friends as well. We, we belong to the same country club here in LA. Okay. Uh, so we play a lot of golf together. So like, I kind of got into it through him. He sat me down. Uh, we were actually at the club one night and he sat me down. Uh, he goes, uh, Fishy, come down here and watch this fight with me. And it was, uh, it was McGregor Diaz. I want to say one. Okay. Um, and, uh, and that was the first fight that I ever saw. Um, wow. Okay. So you're relatively new. Yeah. Yeah. I sat there with him and, um, yeah, a few years, not like, you know, it wasn't, yeah. like, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago, five, something yeah, like that. And, and, um, it was before they, um, yeah, before WME bought the UFC. Um, but I knew Patrick was a huge UFC fan. Um, so I wasn't surprised when they were going through the process of, uh, of buying that company. And now you're breaking down Mackenzie Dern, Marina Rodriguez. Uh, yes. So you've, come a long, you've come a long way. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that later on. But I want to ask you about yourself, your career, uh, and the documentary. The documentary is fantastic, and it really resonated with me, and I know a lot of others. In fact, on Sunday was World Mental Health Day, so what better time than, than now to talk to you about this. Um, you told the LA Times shortly after the doc was released that you hadn't watched it yet. And I think that was around a month or so ago. Have you watched it now at this point? Um, candidly, I haven't. I've, I've, um, I've started it and gotten through like a minute and a half, like 90 seconds, like seven times. And, wow. and, um, and it's just, it's a really a difficult time in my life to relive that sort of 2012, 2013 um, uh, sort of time. And, 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 I'm just afraid of those memories. Um, and I, I, you know, I look, I I've gotten, um, uh, as we talk about like Twitter and direct messages, I've gotten not hundreds, Ariel, thousands, thousands of DMS from people. And, and, and just that like are saying the same thing and I can just sort of scroll through it and it just keeps going and going and going. And I've, I've tried to write everyone back, you know, you know, thank you for watching. And I, you know, and I'm, I'm sorry, you're feeling that way sort of thing. And I hope it helps um, kind of thing with the doc, but, um, but the, the response has been incredible. Um, it's been, um, it's been overwhelming. I don't know what to say when friends text and say, Hey, I'm, I'm really proud of you for coming out with this. I'm proud of you for, I'm just proud to be your friend kind of thing. And, and I, I, I don't know what to say on the second part, because again, like I, I still haven't gotten myself to, 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 to watch it. Um, uh, so, so I don't know. I mean, I, I know that I want to, um, I know that I need to, um, and maybe it'll, maybe it'll help me as well. Um, but it always, it's always, uh, it's always something that when I've been able to talk about it and be open about it, it's selfishly helped me. Um, and so I've been fairly open since 2000, probably 2015, um, you know, really open about what I struggled with, why and how I struggled with it and how I how I beat it and deal with it on a daily basis. Your story is remarkable because you come up as, you know, uh part of this uh, this era of American tennis players on the heels of a great era with the likes of Pete Sampras sort of, uh, you know, revitalizing American tennis. And it's you and Andy Roddick in particular, and you guys go through this whole system and you have success and you have some stumbles along the way and uh, you take a break and you reinvent your body. I'm just trying to give people the Coles Notes version in case they, uh, and I don't want you to kind of go through the entire documentary, but it, it, it really culminates with this 2012 match against um, Roger Federer, where you have to pull out due to mental health issues. At the time, we don't know it's due to mental health issues and, and uh, you know, the extreme anxiety that you were dealing with. And uh, it's amazing because now we're starting to see a lot more of that in, uh, in society and in sports in particular, in tennis and gymnastics and basketball. To come out with this now feels very apropos. And I'm wondering, was this your idea or did the production team reach out to you and say, we want to do a documentary? Like, are, are you, were you a part of the production or were you just a subject in this film? I was, um, I was a big part of it, but we filmed it in 2018. Wow. It, it was supposed to come out, um, 2020. 
uh, COVID changed uh, some things or, you know, sort of just the the timing of how they, you know, say they had to finish all five of those uh, uh, of those docu- documentaries in that, in that series. Um, and I don't think they finished them in time. And I think that's probably why they pushed it. Um, you know, I can imagine it's pretty difficult to, you know, find all that footage and everything with, from all five of those docs, um, which are all, the others are phenomenal as well. Um, uh, uh, and I love the, the coal miners daughter one was pretty cool too, um, to, to sort of see that. Um, cause you've obviously, I've heard of her of course. Um, so, so, uh, yeah, so we filmed it a long time ago. Um, and, uh, was sort of, you know, it, it sort of, you know, and again, like it's one of those things that just sort of it's funny how things work out and it just worked out to where it was perfect timing. It was after, Naomi Osaka and her French Open issues. Uh, it was after, obviously, the Olympics and Simone Biles. Um, and now we're seeing people come out um, like Tyson Fury, like, you know, yesterday or the day before, you know, and, and, and you know, I think it's really important and great for people um, to understand that, you know, the, the, the first two ladies that I mentioned are stars, total, you know, some of the best to ever do what they do. Um, they're females. Um, and I think a lot of males out there, um, I was disappointed in sort of the response from a couple, you know, from, well, from a lot of people, um, when, when Naomi and Simone came out specifically Simone, where, um, where it's like, she's trained for five years for this specific Olympics and her whole life to be in this position, you think she just doesn't want to compete? Like, and people were saying, yeah, I think she doesn't want to compete. I think she doesn't want to lose. It's like, come on, like we got to educate these people on how she's feeling and why she's feeling like this. Um, and, and, and all the better if she wants to talk about it as well. Um, uh, having male athletes come out and, and sort of say, Hey, this isn't about being soft or, you know, Tyson Fury is a heavyweight champion of the world. He just comes out like that is the ultimate person to come out and say, Hey, this isn't about, um, being tough or not. Like I get punched in the face on a, you know, for, for profit. So like, you know, in, in speaking for, for someone like him and you know, there's been a football players that have, that have said it as well, where, you know, these guys are tough, you know? So it's not like a physical thing where it's like, Hey, I can't handle, being tackled in the NFL or I can't handle being in the ring or the octagon or whatever it is. Um, and I thought that was maybe really important for, um, for them to come out for, for males to come out and say, I also struggle with this stuff um, for people on the edge to go, you know, or who are like, mm, I'm not sure I believe that person or I'm not sure, you know, okay, well, they're pretty tough. That guy's pretty tough. Tyson Fury coming out with a, with a video yesterday that guy's pretty damn tough. <laughs> so I think, um, I think that stuff is great. I think it's stuff's awesome for, for, for people to come, um, to talk about it, to say, let's end this stig- this ridiculous stigma of like not being able to say what you think or feel. Um, and again, I've gotten, you know, those messages that I've gotten on, on Twitter, um, uh, are some, some are, some are so cool that like, you know, that you get the ones where, you know, this doc saved my life and stuff like that. And obviously that's incredible, but, but the ones where I saw your doc and I called my boss right away and told him that I am going to stand up in front of those people and do give that speech, which I wasn't going to do before I saw your doc. So like, it's those kinds of things where it's like everyday people, having everyday struggles, no matter what you do for a living, whether you're a journalist, whether you're a professional tennis player, or whether you work at Google, um, everyone's world is uh, their own. Everyone's everyone's bubble is their own and have their own anxieties and stresses in their life. And it's all, it's all equal and different, if that makes sense, right? Like it's all like every, no, no, just because I was a professional tennis player doing it in, in, in my job just entailed being in front of thousands of people or, or millions watching, whatever. Um, that doesn't mean that my world was bigger than your world as a journalist, still trying to provide for your family, still trying to find that niche in MMA and, and journalism and, and, and trying to break yourself out of that. Like, they, like that's, 
that's your world. And it doesn't mean that because I did it in front of people or you did it in front of people and, and a doctor doesn't do it in front of people that, that ours is bigger than theirs. Um, everyone is equal um, in, in terms of mental health. Mental health doesn't care what your last name is, what you do for a living. Um, it, it can take anyone down if you don't if you don't take care of it. You mentioned earlier that you still haven't watched it and I totally understand why. What is it like, you know, because I know you've done media for this doc and you have to talk about it. You, you have to talk about this a lot. And I can't imagine 10 years ago on the heels of that Federer match, when you're at your lowest, you thinking like now you've become this advocate where you have to relive it and talk about it and be inspirational. Does that get to be draining? Is that exhausting? Um, it can be, I use maybe the word overwhelming a little bit. Cause I get, you know, again, like I do other things. I work in finance in the finance world. I'm the Davis cup captain for the U S I still keep an eye on obviously, you know, American tennis, um, tennis will always be part of my life. Sport will always be part of my life. I've got two kids and a wife, you know, like, so like I, I have life is there obviously. Um, and this adds a lot of, um, a lot of things that can be overwhelming anxiety and stress wise. Um, but it's something that I'm super passionate about, obviously. Um, and something that I really care, um, to tell my story because again, like the whole reason doing it was when I was going through it, I didn't have something or someone, some, someone's success story of mental health to lean on and go, okay, here's someone who was in the sports world, let's say, um, and competing, uh, mental health took them away from their game for their job for a little bit and they got it back. They jumped back into the fire and they were successful at a high level. And I wanted people to have a success story to lean on that were going through some similar issues that I was going through when I didn't have that. Can you recall when you started to feel like you were anxious, like, like, were you an anxious kid? Were you an anxious teenager? When did this start to become a part of your life? Yeah, 2012 Wimbledon. Um, so that's like kind of late June. Um, I had I had a, a heart issue called tachycardia that that uh, was fixed with a, a procedure called an ablation. Um, really quickly, a uh, tachycardia is a electrical issue uh, that that's around your heart. There's electricity around your heart or electrodes. Um, it's like the quarterback to your heart. So when they fire, it tells your heart to beat. So fire, ba bump, fire, ba bump they can, there's thousands of them, they can fire uncontrollably or, or malfunction and they'll fire uncontrollably when they malfunction and your heart doesn't know, but to beat. So they're firing. Um, I trained at a, uh, at a different, you mentioned, um, you know, sort of reinventing my career in the middle of, in the middle of my career, reinventing my, myself and, and losing a bunch of weight, getting on, um, a, a diet, losing over 30 pounds and like really, taking fitness uh, to a different level for me, I trained with a heart rate monitor on. So I knew exactly, uh, I trained really diligently. I knew exactly how high I could get my heart, uh, my heart rate and how, and then how quickly I can get it down within 25, 30 seconds, you know, in between a point and then do that over and over and over again. I couldn't get my heart rate above 192. I, I, like, I, I never saw it above that when this, uh, when these, uh, uh, experiences happened or this tachycardia would happen, um, it would be 220, 230 beats per minute. And so naturally I was like, Oh my God, am I dying? I, I feel like, am I, is my heart going to explode? You know, like, I don't know what's going on. I can't stop it. Um, and it's just, it was just a, I thought I was dying. Like I thought, honest to God, I thought I was dying. And so a couple of times I had to go to the hospital for that. And, and, from that, I, def, I, I feel like along with the stress and anxiety of just, you know, my job and life and everything, um, expectations had changed, things like that, um, that, uh, that, that it, it would, it would, I would, my mind would sort of go back to those traumatic experiences and go, is this going to happen again? Is this happening again? Even though I had the ablation and it was successful, um, I, I, I only felt comfortable on the tennis court. Um, that was kind of like the only time where I had other things to think about um, and, and worry about trying to beat somebody on the other side or trying to, you know, practice and get better and, and do things. So I had things to think about there. Um, that part was taken away from me in the match before I was supposed to play Federer, where I ultimately pulled out. That match was the first time that the anxiety hit me on the court. 
and that was my only safe haven and that was gone and that was a that was a really bad that was rock bottom i mean that was a really really bad time for me to where i was like oh no i can't go anywhere now and i knew it i knew that i could go to the tennis court and get away from it um but wimbledon you know wimbledon was kind of that first time where it was like you know i had the ablation in may and sort of slowly you know just kind of slowly wimbledon then you go to toronto you play in toronto and then we go to Cincinnati. Um, and, and again, I was fine on the court and just terrible off it. But so I would get on the court all the time. And, and that was my solace. And, and so just to be clear, like you're 12, 13, 14, you have no issues with anxiety. You were not Never. that kid. Really? Never. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and, and that match before Federer, you actually win the match. But as you say in the doc, you don't remember much about it. And I'm wondering if um, looking back, and I'm sure you've replayed it a thousand times, is there a part of you that wishes you played the Federer match and even got whooped, like lost, you know, six nothing, six nothing, six nothing, and just kind of showed up as opposed to not showing up? Did you put more stress upon yourself, more, you know, pain brought upon yourself, embarrassment, whatever, because you made the call not to play? Do you, do you ever relive that? Uh, I, I don't. Um, you know, look, partly because like I could have easily walked out there and lost anyways. Right. Um, he, it, we actually played the week before in Cincinnati. We had a really tight match, but he beat me again. Um, so, you know, it wasn't one of those things where it was like, you walk on the court on against Federer in, in that time, in that time of his career. And, uh, you got a good shot to win, you know? So like, you know, there's obviously that in the back of your mind after the fact, um, but, but, you know, obviously not, not before it, you think you can win and you think you can do it. Um, I did get on an airplane that afternoon to try to go home um, uh, and fly home. Cause all I want to do is get home. I've been on the road for a long time, you know, throughout the entire summer um, and start the process, get a doctor, find, you know, find, get some medication, find the therapy that I needed. Um, Cause I didn't have any of that stuff yet. Um, and, and so we tried to get on the plane. One guy behind that sat behind me said, Hey, what happened to you today? You know, kind of thing. And I was just like, Oh no, you know, and, and the door closed on the plane and plane pulls out. I jump up. Thank God my wife is there. Cause I, I'm not the kind of guy that would like cause a stir or anything like that. And she jumps. I say, I can't do that. I can't go. I can't go. And this is New York to LA. It's a long flight, obviously. And um, I'm like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? And it was like super embarrassing, but for her, it wasn't at all. She was like a medical emergency. And she jumps up right away. And um and, and says uh, we got to get off the plane you know and we get off and it's a big you know people watching and like it's like really embarrassed our our bags like you know where it's too late our bags are already gonna go to LA and I just had to get off the plane so like um you know there's a, a couple times like that but no no I, I don't look back and go man I wish I would have played I wonder what would have happened I have no clue how I would have gotten through that match um I have no clue how um, in the dock, it, it, you know, it sort of details uh, us driving to the courts that day, to the site that day to play literally the match that you train your whole life for or, or, or sacrifice your, your, you know, like everything for, you know, fourth round, quarterfinals, U.S. Open, biggest tournament of the year, greatest player of all time. Um, you know, Labor Day weekend, like that's, you know, back when CBS had the call and and, and Dick Enberg was doing it, you know, like those, I remember I was, I was a fan too. So I remember all that stuff. I was playing that match. Like as a kid, I watched that match. I was playing it um, and I couldn't do it. And like, it, and, and, you know, thank God um, my wife again, like, you know, uh, was, was a part of that process because, um, because if she wouldn't have said, Hey, you don't have to play um, driving over to the site um, that day. Um, I never, that, not, that thought never would have crossed my mind. You know, we're trained as athletes to, to never show weakness, never show fear, um, uh, uh, never quit, never give up. And, and I was that to a T, um, uh, uh, you know, I would, I would refuse to put my, my hands on my knees if I was tired to show the other person that, uh, that I was tired. I wouldn't do it. I'd bluff it. Like it was no, you know, like until, until I was dead. Um, and, uh, and so that thought never would have crossed my mind to, to go to the courts and not play that match. And so for her, um, to say, you know, babe, you don't have to play. And I was like, 
right then and there, I was like, you're right. I don't have to play. Um, and I felt better immediately. And, and so that was the start, you know, rock bottom, obviously, but the start of the healing process was saying to myself and being, putting myself first and saying, you're right. I don't have to play. I don't have to think about the USTA and the match that they put on then the fans that have, that have bought tickets for that specific match. And, and, um, you know, as the number one American in the top 10 in the world at the time to playing Federer, um, who's, you know, the greatest player of all time at the time, um, there's a lot of things that go into scheduling a match like that and, and, and people flying in and media and, and, you know, it's just, and, and for once in my life um, or my career, I'd put myself first and said, I can't do this. Um, I can't play. And, and, and that was a, you know, obviously a big, uh, a big turning point for me. So that was September of 2012. And I think you returned in March of 2013, right? Yeah, I did. I came back to, you know, I, again, I felt, you know, it was a long process um, uh, to, to, you know, sort of start the process of, of, of medication and therapy and all that stuff. And, and to get to the point where I even thought about playing again. Um, and I tried to play, stepped on the court in Indian Wells, which is down the road from us, um, uh, a, a tournament that I've had success at, been very comfortable at. Um, so I thought, hey, this is a great starting point to, to see how you feel, um, you know, and went out there and didn't feel great. Um, I played, I tried. Um, I think I even won my first match and, and lost, lost after that. But um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, again, I, you know, I, I toyed with trying to play throughout, um, throughout this process um, to ultimately, you know, ultimately get to finish my career in 2015. And those six months, like, what is life like for you? Um, is it like, are you not leaving your house? How are you, how are you living in those six months? I was, um, uh, the only time I left the house was to go to the doctor, um, to see the doctor. I saw the doctor basically every day for the first couple of weeks, then like five days a week, um, uh, then four days a week, you know, and like sort of, uh, was, um, got it to where I could, um, you know, not have to see him every day. Um, but it took me probably four months to, uh, uh, to do, uh, to go to a movie. My wife and I went to a movie, um, sat right. I had to have a Xanax in my pocket just in case I had, even though I hated taking them, um, I, I had to sit right next to the exit and like, I'll never forget it. And my wife and I went and watched some movie. I have no idea what we watched. Um, but that was the first time that was four months after. Um, so I didn't, I didn't leave my house one time other than is, to go to the doctor. What is it like being a husband during this period where you don't have kids yet? Right. Um, no. but you know, you, you're obviously going through a tough time. Are there thoughts in your mind? Like, what's going to happen to my marriage? You know, she's taking care of me. You know, that's, I think something that people, um, fear is that like, you seem weak to your partner. You seem, um, inadequate. They don't want to take care of someone who can't leave the house. They want to live their life. They don't feel these things. They don't understand what's going on. Are you thinking these things as well? Um, can't remember that. Not, no, probably not. I mean, look, she was, um, she was an angel, literally an angel um, looking after me. If she wasn't there, if I didn't have a support system is massive. Number one for me in like a, a list of if I list a, a few things, three, four things, uh, support system would be number one. Be, being able to be vulnerable with someone, um, letting them know exactly how you feel and, and being open about how you feel is uh, my number one, um, my number one uh, uh, sort of. Uh, way to to beat mental health or to get your mental health under control um and so i was incredibly lucky i have no idea if i'd still be here um if if she wasn't around um i had thoughts of hurting myself um am i going to hurt myself am i going to hurt others around me that are close to me um uh you know i don't own guns or weapons or anything like that so like and thank god i didn't because i have no i you know again like no idea and I'm fairly confident that that I'd be uh, dead or in a ditch somewhere or something um, if uh, if I didn't have the support system of my wife, my family. Uh, my father flew out. He lives in Florida. 
Uh, my parents live in Florida. They flew out from time to time. I, my, I'm big. Uh, I'm from Minnesota, so I'm a big Vikings fan. Like he'd fly out during that time. Um, I remember him coming out like almost every weekend in October to watch the Vikings with me and fly back. Like you know, so incredible support system. Um, and 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 again, like if I didn't have them, um, I it's no telling if I'd still be here or not. When you start to feel better, is it because of medication? Is it because of therapy? Is it a concoction? Like, how do you start to feel like you are turning the corner in life? Because uh, I know some people feel like there's no end, right? It's just this dark tunnel that, you know, how am I going to get out of this? Do you remember that moment when you started to feel like you were turning the corner? I do uh, vividly, actually. I remember thinking to myself as the medication would kick in. See, you know, number two for me would be like medication and therapy, like finding a finding a psychiatrist um, that can that can uh, prescribe medication can prescribe the correct um, uh, the correct uh, uh, dosage or, or, or drug for you um, that can sort of help start the process. I'm a pretty big believer in that. I know there are people that are in the mental health world that um, that don't believe in the medication. Um, I don't know, again, like this, one of those things, I don't know where I would have been or how I would have gotten to the point to start the process of healing without the medication to just sort of take the, I didn't mess with my cognitive at all, but like you just sort of take that anxiety edge off a little bit. And I just remember going like one day, just going, I didn't think about it as much as I did yesterday. Um, and that was like, you know, moment one of the healing process. And, 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 and again, for those people, and I know that it, it felt like when I was in it, you know, I was think I always say to my wife, I just can't wait to, to go back and I'm not a big drinker alcohol wise, but I, you know, like a, a beer or two from time to time with my friends and um, I don't drink anymore, but I used, used to, and, and um, uh, uh, you know, I just said, I, I can't wait to get back to being able to like go play golf and have a beer with my friends afterward, like just as simple as that. And um, I couldn't do it for months and months and months. Um, and, uh, and eventually, you know, and, and during that, during that time, you're like, I'm never going to get out of this. When is this going to end? When is this going to end? Um, I remember asking my psychiatrist and this still rings true to this day. So just can't wait for this to be over and move on with my life. Forget about this and move on. Cause I was going in the right direction. And he says, Marty, you'll, this will always be part of your life. You will, this will, this will, this part of your life, you'll remember forever. You'll always have um, an issue with, uh, 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 not, um, you know, word this correctly, like you'll, you'll always issue isn't right. The right term. You, you'll always, you'll, this will always be something that, um, you'll have to deal with on a daily basis, whether you may think about it that day or not. Um, you know, I have some awesome weeks now, um, where I don't think about it at all. And then I have a, I'll have a day where I'm overwhelmed and, and it'll take me back a little bit and I'll have to go outside and, 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 you know, sit on my phone and play a, play a game of, of hearts or something like that on my phone, you know, like as simple as just taking my mind off of what's going on. Um, and then like the third thing would be um, for me is like learning, developing the tools to learn how to change. I call it changing the channel on your mind or changing the channel on negative thoughts. So like literally just picking up a remote control and changing the channel on, on uh, when you're having anxiety or stress or panic um, to develop the tools because you can, everyone can develop the tools to go, okay, I'm going to take my mind somewhere else. And, you know, for me, it was golf. I, I, you know, it was like sort of an outlet for me um, outside of tennis was, was golf. So I would very vividly and detailed, take my mind and take myself to my most favorite place in the world, which is a place in North Carolina where I grew up going, uh, spending summers. Um, I would, I would vividly uh, put the tee in the ground. Uh, what color was the tee? What number was the golf ball? Um, uh, uh, what was the weather like? Was there wind? What was the smell like? Things like that really detailed and vivid about where, where I took my mind. Um, and my the thought was to just play the golf course. So hit the shot. How did it go? You know, beautiful drive straight down the middle, you know, every time. And, um, I never, uh, I never got to the fourth hole, never in my, uh, 10 years or nine years of dealing with this. Um, I, I, I I've gotten to the third hole 
and and my mind is sort of gone and I'm I'm thinking about other things now and and I've changed the channel on those negative and anxious moments or anxious thoughts. Um, so that, that, you know, developing the tools, that's just a tool that I use. doesn't work for everyone. Maybe it works for some people. Maybe some people listening to this can try it. Um, take your mind to a place to where uh, you're most happy, um, you're most comfortable and vividly put yourself in there um, and, and, and think about how, um, how much that makes you happy how much that puts you in a really good frame of mind and um and uh and that can change the change the narrative of your thoughts right then um since the federer match that that was not to be have you had any real you know setbacks if you will or is it just the constant you know as you mentioned some good days some bad days good weeks bad weeks is there something that we don't know about that you know happened recently or has it been you know pretty no, yeah. pretty it's been pretty, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a good question. I mean, it's, it's, um, once I got, um, there's like, I sort of felt like there was sort of a hump to get over. Once I got over that hump, it was sort of like, okay, yes, I got on an airplane and I had a panic attack. Okay. Lots of people do that. That happens. Um, sometimes I was by myself. I had, okay, what happened with that? Why did that happen? You know, you sort of take yourself out of the situation and go, okay, how did that, happen. Okay. Uh, you know what? I actually had an extra cup of coffee that day. Um, maybe that's too much caffeine for me to get on a plane by myself. Um, so let's, let's bring it down to one cup in the morning instead of two. And there, you know, there's obviously sacrifices you have to make, um, to, to really get yourself out of it. Um, but you can learn from every episode that you have. Um, and that's what I tried to do. And I'll still have episodes every, you know, every so often and, and have to deal with it. Um, but you win, you know, and you win, you try and win every day um, mentally and, um, and, and just, you know, keep going. Um, I, I will ask you this question um, by prefacing that this is something that, you know, happened to me recently. So I've been very anxious, my, and I'm not trying to make this about myself, but just so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, I've been a very anxious person my whole life. Uh, I've had moments of horrendous anxiety, especially in college. And uh, during the pandemic, especially early on, uh, I was actually really happy because it's like, oh, I don't have to go anywhere. I could just be home with my kids and my wife. And this is great. No, um, you know, no obligations to do anything, no obligations to go to, um, you know, the airport, to be away from them, etc. And then when I started to have to go back, um, I remember I was asked to go do an NBA game for ESPN. Uh, in Milwaukee. And I just I felt like I physically couldn't leave my house. I was so because of the pandemic, because I was home in this routine, and because of everything going on in the world, I physically could not leave my house. And that's why I went out and uh, seeked help. And uh, why I talked to a therapist, uh, it, it was enough, enough was enough, like I really physically felt like I couldn't do it. And uh, I know the pandemic has, you know, affected a lot of people. Uh, how has it been for you? Did you feel like it got at all worse? Uh, during this past, you know, almost two years. Yeah. yeah, candidly, initially, it got a lot worse um, to the point to where my wife is Jewish. So we had, um, it was uh, around April. Passover, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, so Passover, there you go. Yep, so yep. so um, I was uh, tasked to uh, pick something up at her parents' house. Um, you know, it was just like, you know, you're you're sort of you know, again, like what's going on with the world? What is this thing? Why do we have to wear these masks everywhere? Blah, blah, blah. Are we, die? is everyone going to die? You know, kind of, kind of thoughts like everybody else had. And I, I was tasked to drive over, drop something off and come back. And I was to, to be home at four 30, you know, and uh, I got stopped by a cop for a, a, a lane change without the blinker. I mean, come on, like the most ridiculous <laughs> sort of one. And I got, I, you know, and I got pulled over. I was late dropping it off. I got back. I was late starting the Zooms that we were doing with the, you know, because we weren't, no one was seeing each other. So we were doing the Zoom Passover. The wife was upset, but didn't know what was going, you know, that I was late and why I was late or whatever and got on me. And I, phys and I'm not a crier, like really at all. And I just broke down like right there. And I was just like, I got stopped by a cop and like this and that. And like, I just, I can't do that, you know? And like, so yes, like I was as human as possible um, uh, uh, during COVID or just, just during the beginning of the pandemic, because like everybody else, 
we were trying to figure out what was going on. We, I'm not used to being home that much. I've always moved around my entire life, even my junior career or junior tennis, since I was 15, 14, 15, I've moved around my entire life. Um, so, so, uh, so I wasn't used to being home for months on end and I was, um, so that was uncomfortable for me as well. Like just didn't, was outside of, you know, again, outside my comfort zone. And, um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was rough. Um, not as rough on me as it was for others, because again, I had the, I had the support system. I had the, the, the doctor and the therapy, and I had the tools to sort of, to sort of take my mind out of those uncomfortable situations. Um, I was able to, um, I, I now after all of this, um, and, and again, this is obviously before the documentary came out, but I've, I've, um, I've had the opportunity to, to sort of talk to a lot of either collegiate athletes, collegiate tennis players, collegiate, um, um, you know, sort of young aspiring athletes um, have reached out, whether it's on Twitter or whatever. And I'll, a lot of them, I'll, I'll talk to them um, and, and go uh, and, and have, you know, develop a relationship and a friendship and, and say, you know, let, tell me what you're thinking, what's going on. I wish I had someone like this that would do that would have done this for me. So I'll do this for, for this person kind of, kind of um, experiences. And, and um, these kids had some rough times, man. I mean, rough times during the beginning where they, they didn't, they wanted to stay at college, but, a lot of people left college and they didn't, you know, so they're by themselves. And, you know, it was just like a, you know, wait, wait, weights upon weights on their shoulders of, of trying to compete in their collegiate sport, as well as trying to get good grades and things like that. And I've talked to a lot of randomly, just a lot of, you know, again, collegiate athletes that, that really struggled. Um, um, and, and, and I, I loved doing that because a, it made me feel better. Per, like just selfishly, like I, I always felt better about my anxiety when I opened up and talked about it. Like right now, I feel great about talking about my mental health. Um, and then it made me feel great to help people, to help somebody, to be that person that they can lean on and still text to this day. And that was, you know, a year and a half ago. Hey, how you doing? How you feeling? Oh, I feel this. I feel that. I feel great. I don't feel great. You know, things, you know, and, and so it's nice to just, again, like, it's nice to just be a, that success story to where people can say, oh yeah, I remember that guy. Um, I remember his name, his last name was weird fish name or whatever. I don't like tennis or talk tennis or watch anything, but I remember that name. And I remember that guy, he came out with that mental health thing and now he's, now he's doing really well. That's great. And, and that, that was the goal. Um, I'm curious how you feel about this. It's something that I worry about. I was talking, I'm, I'm not going to name names, but I was talking to um, a fighter recently who uh, was going through some stuff and uh, they told me that um, they couldn't compete due to mental health issues. And uh, then I spoke to someone very close to them and asked how they were doing. And the person said, no, this isn't mental health. They are using that, uh, it's X, Y, and Z, and it's kind of a crutch because mm -hmm. now it's a topic that people are talking about and people are trying to be sensitive to it. Are you worried that because this is now being talked about so much that people don't quite understand what this is and will just use it, quite frankly, as an excuse to get out of things? Is this something that you fear? Um no, uh, what I fear uh, most is the person who who you went to after and said um, and that that said no, he's just using this. That person, I, I would guess, would w is is uneducated on mental health, what mental health is, what what it feels like. Um, that person probably has never, and again, just to guess, that person has never gone through or dealt with mental health issues or had anyone close to them deal with it. Um, that's just educating people on what it may feel like. Um, do you think that fighter, I mean, these, these fighter, you're talking about, you're talking about the gnarliest dudes and men and women on the planet like that want to get paid what they get paid, which you, I know you've talked a lot about, which is not enough um, to, uh, to beat their heads in every, you know, every time they go out there, these people are tough. They are the definition of tough. Um, so if someone like that 
comes to you and says, Hey, I, I don't feel well. And, and my mental health isn't right. I don't feel good. Um, man, I'm going to believe them. Um, because those people are, those people are the definition of tough. And, and that's the idea is education, educating those that don't understand. It's the, it's the people that thought, um, Naomi Osaka is just going to pull out of the French open because she doesn't want to talk to the media. It's the people that thought that Simone Biles thought that she was going to lose. So she didn't want to compete in the Olympic games. Um, those are the people that you're trying to touch and hit, um, and educate on mental health. When you hear stories like that, very recently, one that hit close to home for me, uh, my favorite hockey team, the Montreal Canadiens, my favorite goalie is Carey Price. And now he comes he out. the best goalie, in, best goalie in the NHL. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's I'm, I'm, I'm probably biased, but I think he is, uh, <laughs> he's an absolute legend. He'll never have to buy a meal in Montreal. Um, and now he says that, you know, he can't play and the details are a little bit uh, unclear, but it appears as though based on what his wife wrote that he's dealing with some mental health issues. When you see these stories come out, does it take you back to 2012? How do you react when this comes out? For sure, because, you know, what would have been the the press release for myself in 2012 if I was going to say, hey, I'm not playing because of my mental health? Um I have no idea how I would have like put that together or how my agent would have put that together. Um, so we don't know, you know, we have no idea the scope of, of him. Um, uh, uh, I'm, you know, I, I don't know him at all. Of course I've heard of him, um, but I, I don't know him at all. I'm proud uh, of him and his wife uh, who sounds like a saint as well, just like mine um, an angel. I call her. So she's, she's probably, um, just like that. Um, it sounds like he has a phenomenal support system um, around him, which again, I said is number one, first and foremost for me um, in, in mental health. So, so yeah, I mean, like, I don't know, you know, you're right. Like it was worded differently to where it was like kind of vague to where, how he's feeling. He, you know, didn't say like, Carrie is dealing with anxiety and this is X, Y, and Z. Like it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's really difficult. It's been impossible for me to articulate. I don't have the vocabulary. Maybe you do. You sound smart. Um, <laughs> where, uh, where to, to, to articulate exactly what anxiety feels like, you know, it's like, okay. Um, feels like I want to curl up into a ball and I've got a lot of things on my plate and I just don't, I don't know what to, do. it's just really difficult for me to vote, uh, to, to articulate exactly. I don't have the vocabulary to do it. Um, I don't think many people do. So like, it's really hard to, to actually put in terms of um, how, how you want it to come out uh, for someone like him, who's in the, obviously the spotlight, um, how to put out a, a public statement um, is never going to be worded perfectly for everyone to understand. But for you and I who have dealt with anxiety issues, um, you're like, good for him. You know, good for him to to put that first. Um, I guarantee you this isn't the first time he's dealt with this stuff. Um, he probably has had it for years and never felt comfortable coming forward um, and saying and stepping away from his job. Uh, probably felt pressure from either the fans or the franchise or whatever. I don't know team sports very well at all, but like I don't know the dynamic of the pressure of, of competing and in, in, you know, getting guaranteed money and having to compete like that. Um, and just saying, Hey, my mental health is, is hurt as opposed to my ankle is hurt or my, my shoulder is hurt and I can't perform. Um, so I don't know the pressures of that. Maybe there's something there to where they didn't under, you know, they don't feel super comfortable, you know, the way they, you know, the way you worded. I don't know. Um, but I'm again, like, again, I'm, I've never met him super proud of him for coming out his wife obviously for, for coming out um and saying that this is what's going on and we're going to take a step away and just curious and by the way we're, we're rounding third here i appreciate the time very much um this this is great uh for you you didn't initially say it was mental health the reason why you pulled out of the match when did you first reveal that and why did you do so when you did it was probably um to my friends, it was probably 2013, you know, like maybe, maybe a year later. Um, 
maybe to my family, you know, I get, I get things from my mom. I remember my mom, what should I tell my friends? You know, like, and I'm like, I don't know what you should tell your friends, mom. Like I'm not <laughs> feeling well. So like, I don't know what you should tell your friends. Are you playing again? You know, kind of thing, you know, and there's always, and my mom's the best, like, so it's, yeah. you know, just the most supportive mother you could have. So like, if, if, if that's what people are dealing with, with a really supportive mother, imagine like, you know, parents that, you know, we don't know the dynamic of, again, Naomi, I bring, keep bringing Naomi and, and Simone because they're just such stars. Um, and it was so polarizing what they did um, or what they were going through that um, we don't know their family dynamic. Obviously, we know what Simone has gone through, which is a hell. Um, but I don't know, you know, I know Naomi, but I don't know her family situation and, you know, what her parents are like or not or whatever. Um we don't know these reasons. And so the, 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 one of the main things that I came away from this whole thing um, was judgment. And I was always kind of a, why'd that guy do that? Why'd that person do that? Um, that's weird. Why did they, you know, I wouldn't have done that, you know, kind of thing. Um, I don't judge people anymore, or at least I try not to. Because you just have no it, mental health is a physical. It's your brain. Your brain is part of your body. It's physical. I think it's physical, even though it says mental health, it's part of your body. It's an injury that's part of your body that just isn't. Um, it's not something you can see. It's you have another injury in your body and you're limping. You have an ankle injury and you're limping. You're on crutches. We see Conor McGregor is on crutches. We can see he's injured. Um, you can't see that Carey Price is going through what he's going through because it's internal. Um, and that's why it's really, it's really helpful that people don't judge others as to why they do certain things um, because they have no idea what's going through their head. Do you worry um, about whether or not your kids will go through this? Um, not really. I mean, that you know, my, I, my son is uh my son is a softy, you know, like his mom, he's got like, uh, he, he's just like his mom looks like his mom, thank God. And, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, he's, I, I had, we had a golf tournament yesterday, he plays golf, um, we're trying to get him into golf, nine hole uh, golf tournament. And um, first couple holes didn't go well, he's mopey and, and stuff. And you want to, you want them to have fun and not burn themselves out to where, they can, they're forced to do it and they feel like they're forced to do something. Um, so I'll, I'll always be open to, there's a fine line, right? Like, it's like, are you quitting because you just don't want to, you don't want to play and you're quitting on your teammates or are you feeling uncomfortable and anxious and you don't, you know, and like, let's talk it through. Let's make sure that you verbalize your thoughts internally to me or to your family, to your parents um, and, and, you know, I mean, I, I feel like I have the tools to either spot it or help get through it, um, or help get it right away, um, catch it right away with my kids. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's prevalent clearly. Um, it's prevalent, it's prevalent in children a lot. Um, and, and, um, and again, and again, this pandemic and these kids and they've got, you know, out here, they have to wear masks all, all day at school. And so they're, you know, they're, they're, it's just, it's they're, what's going on. They're like, what is, what is this, you know, and four years old and six years old and seven, you know, like it's, it's really hard to, to understand what's going on as a, as a child. So, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's hard right now and life is hard sometimes and life's also amazing. And when it's hard, um, you, you must be good to yourself. Um, uh, take, you know, put yourself first before, others for once, probably in your life, you know, like people always put others in front of them. Most people, most good people, most people that you want to be friends with do. And, um, and, and it's important to put yourself first right now. Um, put your family first, uh, uh, and, and, and make sure that you yourself are good before, um, before you can try and help others. Is there something that you make sure to do, be it big or small every day so that you kind of have a good day. I mean, obviously there are factors that will influence that, but is it maybe in the morning as you wake up, there's a lot, like I look at my phone when I wake up and I hate that. And I wish I could stop that. And I think that that would help me greatly. There's little things that I would love to correct. Is there something that you do that uh, helps you? I, I do that too. Honestly, I do that too. But I, my phone is, is an outlet for me because there's a lot of things on there that are helpful. Mm -hmm. 
a lot of things that can sort of take my mind off it. I mean, I get my news from Twitter. So like, it's hard to not, you know, like I tried to, I, I, I uh, uh, deactivated it uh, at, at one stage and, you know, reactivated it like a, a week later. So it was just like, well, how am I going to get my news now? You know, like, <laughs> it was hard. It was hard. It was hard. So like, I, you're right. Like we're, 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 uh, we're addicted to that thing. Um, and those, those devices. Um, yes. I, I, I go outside a lot. Um, I'll take time um, on my own. Um, I like, um, uh, I like, I like having, you know, 15, 20 minutes on my own, um, just to go outside, sit in the sun. I I'm a big a believer in, in sweating, trying to sweat every day, um, to some, in some capacity exercising every day. Um, uh, you know, and, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's getting, you know, I, I try and get sun every day and exercise every day. Um, from then, if I feel like feeling like I've over, like I'm overwhelmed, I want to re reply to a bunch of people for, for, for this documentary or something like that. Um, and it feels like it's a lot of people and I got to, you know, I'll, I'll go outside, I'll sit in the sun. Um, I'll take my mind off it. I'll play a game. Like I said, like I'll play a game of hearts or something like that to where it like takes my mind away from what I was just doing, j j even if it's just five minutes. Uh, two last things. Um, number one is a personal one. So I'm a big sports fan. Uh, I won't say that tennis is my favorite sport growing up. I was a huge basketball fan, football, baseball, the traditional team sports. My wife, coincidentally, is a massive tennis fan, more of a player than a watcher, but she okay. has great appreciation for it. Um, most important of all, I'm very proud of where I'm from, Canada. And I'm feeling like my country is producing a lot of great tennis players right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, most notably, Leila Fernandez, who had an incredible run. Unfortunately, she fell short. But nothing makes, you know, is one thing when like the Montreal Canadiens hockey team does well, that's great. A lot of those guys aren't from Montreal or Canada. Uh, it's another when it's someone in a singular sport, whether it's fighting, tennis, uh, does a big thing on, on a big stage. And especially these young athletes, I mean, it's just so inspiring. What's going on in Canada? Like, are, are we better than the States? Is that, is that a thing now? What's happening here? Cause it feels right like now, yes. right now, right now on the men's side, not the women's side, although Layla is Layla, Layla and I randomly have the same agent. I, I was in the U S so I was at, it was in New York and yeah. I've made my same agent for 25 years and his name's John Tobias. And, and I, I, I said, oh, you want to grab some lunch? He said, I, I've got to watch a, a client play. And I said, who, who is it Layla Fernandez? And I was like, who's Layla Fernandez? Like, why do you have Layla? I was like, why, again, like, I was like, why do you have Layla Fernandez? I've never heard of her. Um, and, uh, and sure, you know, she makes the finals of the tournament. All of a sudden, like I'm, uh, uh, I've, I've gotten to become uh, good friends again because of tennis with Steve Nash. Nash, he's a huge tennis fan. Um, and, and, uh, and so we talk, uh, uh, Canadian tennis all the time. Um, whenever somebody wins, he'll shoot me a text or something and beats an American or something. I'll get a text from him. Um, and, uh, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm an, I'm a Layla Fernandez fan in two days later and Nash is going to and sitting in her box for the, yeah. for the US open final, you know? So like pretty, pretty awesome, um, stuff they've got, uh, I love Felix Auger Aliasim. Um, I love him personally. What an awesome kid. Um, uh, no stone unturned with that kid. Um, he is going to, whatever happens in his career is going to be uh, uh, because he works his butt off. He's tried every single thing to get as good as he could possibly get. Um, I, 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 I watch him and I see a young Federer at times um, with the way that he plays his sort of um uh, his ability to just play offense. Um, this is getting really deep tennis, tennis talk, but like it, his ability to, to play aggressively, to hit shots, to try shots that like, I wouldn't even try and practice. Um, and he tries them in, you know, five all in the third set of like big matches um, is, is Federer like for me. Um, so I see a lot of that in him. Wouldn't shock me if he won multiple grand slams. Um, Dennis, uh, Dennis Shapovalov again is just, you know, again, an incredible, incredible talent. He's top 15 in the world. Um, these guys are going to be in the top 10 in no time. Um, uh, we don't play them in Davis cup this year. Thankfully, um, <laughs> uh, thankfully we played them last year. Uh, Vasek Pospisil beat us, um, 
uh, beat us and uh, Shapovalov beat us. And then we won the doubles. So we lost two to one to Canada. So we last, you know, so you're only as good as your last match. And we lost, we lost last time. So I will say Canada has some, has better players at the top right now. But um, as far as the men's side on the U S we are deep and we are coming and we're coming after FAA and we're coming after Shapo and Raonic and anyone who wants and anyone who wants the sauce. And then uh, on the women's side, we're stacked. Yeah, uh, the U.S. is stacked on the women's side, so we're good on the women's side. I know they've had, you know, it's it's awesome. I mean, it's great that Canada is a great tennis uh, country as well. I always loved, uh, uh, almost won the tournament in Montreal. There, Djokovic beat me for like the twentieth time um, in the final there uh, in two thousand eleven. But had you know great memories from those tournaments, awesome tournaments. So um, it's always fun to fun to go up there and compete. I will just remind people that the state that you live in has more people living in it than the whole country of Canada. So, you know, it's not exactly uh, apples to apples, but I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. I'm just saying, you know, I feel like we're doing pretty well. Lastly, uh, you mentioned to me on uh, text yesterday that uh, the fight that you're most looking forward to is Justin Gaethje versus Michael Chandler. Like I said, you're a massive MMA fan, which I appreciate greatly. I love when you're just randomly tweeting about, you know, a random fight night. Um, is there a guy or a, a, a woman right now that is number one for you? Like you are going, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. That is your fighter. This is the one you're following. You know, sometimes we get emotionally invested in these characters. Who's your your number yeah. one right now that you really love watching? I, you know what? I love Ortega. I mm-hmm. love watching Brian Ortega. I love his like composure in the ring. I love he's tough as anybody. Um, I love his like submission game. He can submit, he submits people on the on the feet like it's incredible uh so i love that i love the spectacle of connor uh greatest self-promoter since ali um but but wasn't you know an incredible fighter five six seven years ago i mean just awesome i watched those khabib was was insane for me um to watch i love watching shevchenko Mm. i mean she you know because like i come from the muay thai kickboxing sort of uh um background now and i come from it like eight months ago. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what i mean and and i watch those types of fighters i mean she is just i mean all all the above i mean just their kicking game i mean just incredible um incredible i'm trying to think yeah like i just i, I love that gaichi chandler fight because i feel like gaichi's like he lost, he, he lost to Khabib and then he hasn't fought since then. And like, he, he was on a roll then he gave Khabib a pretty good fight, but I mean, no one's, no one's winning rounds against Khabib then. So I, I just, and then Chandler comes over from Bellator and, and, and takes it by storm right away. I felt like he got caught by Oliveira, you know, kind of on like a, I don't want to call it a freak thing, but like, I feel like if, if he was maybe winning that fight or going to win that fight. So like those two, are very similar fighters to me, you know, sort of the boxing wrestling background. Um, I love, you know, again, I love watching Gage, but I, I love it all, dude. Like, like you said, like I, wa- I love watching Mackenzie Dern. Like I love that jujitsu background. That jujitsu stuff is so cool for, for us, like sort of really, really, really young amateur people that are watching uh, mixed martial arts, just like the way they can finagle themselves on the ground and even the, the leech and, and, um, and uh, uh, who did he, fight? Uh, 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 Charles, uh, who did he fight? The, the, just, this Oh, Damon of, Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and um, who was it? Uh, uh, was it? Uh, cut uh, him open. And, and uh, it was Rosa, little, Charles, yes, Rosa. Charles Rosa. And it was a bloodbath. Like, yes. Yeah, even that guy, like it just their their submission game and stuff is so cool. Um, and something that I want, you know, I'll never come close to, but want to learn, um, want to learn badly. So I'm I have massive respect for mixed martial arts fighters, uh, the craft itself. Um, I love it. I love watching. I watch every single UFC fight. I try to watch every Bellator fight. Huh. I watch every single UFC fight. Well, I can't wait for the amateur debut. Please let me know. I'd love to break the news. It would be a huge oh, no. story. Please let I'll me let know. I'll let you know after. <laughs> when I get knocked out, I'll let you know after how it went. I'll send you the video. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Um, congratulations on an incredible film. Uh, you've helped a lot of people. You know this. You don't need me to tell you this. Um, but it's just uh, it's something that I urge anyone who is a tennis fan, isn't a tennis fan, dealing with mental health issues, isn't. it's just a, a phenomenal film. And I hope that one day 
you'll be able to enjoy it and watch it and be proud of it as well. Thank you so much for the time. Good luck to you and the Davis Cup team. And I'm so happy that we've been able to meet and connect over MMA. And I, I can't thank you enough for giving us an hour of your time to talk about all of this. Really appreciate it. Likewise, buddy. I'm a big fan, like I told you before, and, and I'll continue to watch your stuff. So um, keep it going. It's fun stuff. Thank you. Thank you.